Okay. No, as soon as I'm done with the introductions, I'll be leaving. But you are controlling this computer, no, not, not this one. I'm not doing anything. Okay. Doing speakers. Okay. Does this computer go away? No. It's going to stay here. It is. So I'm really just trying to find a place to put them. There's a shelf down here where they'll be uh, picking up voices. Oh. So I'll just do this for now. That's okay. Or maybe I can sit them over there if they'd be less in the work way. Um, this thing doesn't go the whole way. No, it doesn't. They're going to be on the ground. <laughs> oh, well. Well, I'm using, I mean, I, I can do both. Well, I can't do both remotes, but I can flip okay, through the slides here. This. So this is forward and this is back. Oh, yeah. I ladies and gentlemen. As you make your way to your seats, if you're not already there, we'd appreciate it if you would find a seat. Uh, my name is Gail Formanak, co-president of the League of Women Voters of the Villages Tri-County area. We'd like to welcome you to Uprooting Prejudice, Conversations for Change. This is the first community event our league has sponsored and we're happy to see you here today to join in on this very timely topic. Unfortunately, we live in a world of increasing political division and some of those divisions are driven by lingering racism. I am anxious to hear from our speakers and also to hear your thoughts when we get to the audience input. So, um, Couple of things. We are the League of Women Voters, and this is our event. We're thrilled to have you here. Couple of things. I'd ask if you would turn your cell phones off or mute them. If you have an emergency phone call that you absolutely must take, please step outside. There will not be a break. So feel free to get up and use the restrooms as needed. You can see this is a little map, actually, yeah, I got it right there, a uh, map of the, um, the facility and the restrooms are in yellow. So back here, back there, they're all over. So you can find a restroom fairly easily from your seat, I'm sure. Please know that this presentation is being recorded. We are live on Facebook and we will also make a recording available on YouTube later. Uh, we'll do our best during the conversation that follows our speakers to uh, capture our uh, audience participants. So I am ready now to introduce our moderator of the day. Lou Sasmore has a background in electrical engineering with a PhD in biomedical engineering. He had a career in various corporations, including Westinghouse, where he worked in early computers and medicine. Uh, he also worked for Cordis Corporation doing cardiac pacemaker research and development and has several patents in his name. He was an adjunct professor at the University of Miami and taught high school math and physics and was Dean of ITT Tech in Miami for five years. He's currently retired here in the villages and moderates and coordinates the Civil Discourse Club, which is one of the longest running and largest uh, clubs of its kind. Sure, we need more civil discourse and I'm 
sure that Lou will make sure it's civil today. <laughs> so we're moving on and Lou will be introducing our speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. I'm honored to be serving as moderator for the discussion of this League of Women Voters program. At first, I thought I was part of the diversity effort. Well, I am a voter, but there was a small issue of gender, League of Women Voters. But I was informed that men have been vote able to be members since 1972, so I'm not right. diversity. <laughs> Really, I'm proud to be part of this program whose aim is to conduct civil conversations about issues that are both divisive and explosive, that can divide us rather than bring us together. Our two speakers this afternoon will discuss some potentially upsetting issues, not to upset us, but to start us thinking about positive changes we can assist in. Our first speaker today, is Ann Patton and is a uh, consultant and grassroots volunteer focusing on community building and grass and uh, social justice, as well as a member of the Orange County League of Women Voters. Somebody's playing with our mic, okay. Uh, she's the author of five nonfiction books, as well as numerous articles, reports, presentations, mostly focusing on community, human rights, disaster preparation and, and recovery, and sustainability. Anne has worked as a national consultant specializing in disaster management, urban affairs, and grassroots partnership building. She has over 45 years experience in program management, journalism, and uh, consulting. She is the head of her own small publishing company, as well as a professional writing and consulting firm. This, this afternoon, Anne is gonna be presenting material based in large part on her book, Unmasked, The Rise and Fall of the 1920s Ku Klux Klan. It's both disturbing and uplifting. So Anne, the podium is all yours. Hi there. So I am hope I'm not going to mess this up if I put my script on top of the computer. Is that going to am I going to kill the whole program? I don't. I'll tell you what. Let's do let's do this. So Lou, I want to thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm sorry I don't have a more interesting life, <laughs> but I think of you often because I. I have, whoa, it does work, doesn't it? I think of Lou often because I have a pacemaker. And I am so grateful for your work, Lou, on, on, on keeping, keeping us old folks alive. Okay, it's great to, goodness, you guys look so good from here. <laughs> this is a wonderful room and a wonderful place. I am so glad to be here to talk to you about an important subject that I call, in summary, overcoming hate with understanding. I want to give special thanks to Charlene Griffin and her really amazing team of people who have put this event together. So uh, at the Tri-County League, could we? What a, what a great team. And it's, it's been an honor, particularly also to share this, this stage with Stephen and Lou, and a great experience to work together to plan this program today. I also want you to know a few people who have come here from Orange County, my home league. So could the Orange County people stand up? I, I, I'm, my pit crew is Joy Dickinson here in the front row and Joan back at the back, but we've also got our former president, Gloria Picard, and our, our at jack of all trades, how can I say, with, uh, with Sue, who's going to wave her hand. So, and are there any others here from the Orange County League? I know there are people watching online. So I hope this is the beginning of things that we can do together. I have, I have discovered this league now, and I don't want to let you go. 
We have a triple headed program today with Stephen and Lou, but I'm the warm up act. So I want to tell you a story today. It's what I call a true parable because I think it's packed with lessons for today, but it is indeed a true story. You know, we have suddenly been thrust into a moment when history is being written with bold strokes. We're in the throes of a historic battle right now, today, between democracy and autocracy. In fact, not to be too melodramatic, but I think it is justified. We're seeing a historic battle between good and evil. Travel back with me a hundred years, almost precisely a hundred years, when our democracy was also challenged and yet survived to bounce back and thrive. That's the lesson for today. Turn your thoughts back with me to the 1920s, the jazz age, and a dark underside that may be less well known because the 1920s were in fact the golden era for the Ku Klux Klan. I didn't know that. I never learned that in school, but a few years ago, I became so interested in the story that I wrote a book about it. It's kind of my hobby. If I get interested in something, I end up with a book. Uh, the name of the book is Unmasked, which today we know now has a double meaning. Unmasked, <laughs> the rise and fall of the 1920s Ku Klux Klan. And in fact, and this is the shameless commerce part of the program. Joan Irwin has copies back at the book table. Thanks to our host for letting us bring them. This story is somewhere between a true crime book based on facts and a social history of political history. But again, I think it has lessons for today. You know, historians say there are at least three eras for the Klan in America. First was the original one, the Reconstruction Klan, created after the Civil War to terrorize former slaves back into a kind of legalized slavery. That's the Klan we often hear and, and think about. But it sort of went dormant and then in the 20s was reborn as a very different animal that boasted millions of members. And in fact, the 1920s Klan was mainstream. It was, it was very popular. We'll talk, about, we'll talk more about that today. And third, the third era is the so-called modern Klan, a weakened and splintered group that has never died out. I personally think we're now in the fourth era of the Klan. And that is that the spirit of the Klan roams free and thrives under many different names. What do you think of when you think of the 1920s, 100 years ago? I think of dark days too, that may be less well known. The 1918 flu, when so many people were dying, there were entire towns left with no one to bury the dead. The 1918 flu is suddenly relevant to us today. The world was in chaos and rapid fire technological and social changes were destabilizing the whole front. This is beginning to sound familiar. It sounds a little bit like today. Immigration was soaring. So the county was overrun by foreigners and communists and even Catholics and Jews. <laughs> The nation was turning inward and slamming its open door shut. For Pete's sake, women wanted the vote too. And, and, and black people wanted to vote. What was the world coming to? Maybe in reaction, white supremacy had gone mainstream. Thousands of people, mostly black, were lynched during the years between the Civil War and 1950. Sometimes, and this is the worst, sometimes they were lynched in raucous community festivities. A broad swath of the country believed the South should have won the Civil War, which they celebrated by erecting all those Confederate statues that now in Lake County are getting moved 
out of the way. Uh, race massacres came back into fashion when white mobs burned out entire black towns. Okay, Okoe on our doorstep is, is, is a prime example. There was a milestone in 1915 with an amazing new movie, Birth of a Nation, that was Hollywood's first uh, blockbuster hit, glorified the old reconstruction KKK's war against what they considered to be black savages. There arose a cry to bring back the Klan to defend pure white womanhood. Inspired by Birth of a Nation, nostalgia for the old Klan crystallized in Atlanta when a boozy dreamer named Colonel William Simmons summoned the Klan from its slumber. He was quite a character. Colonel Simmons was a fraternalist, not a word I knew. He believed in men's fraternities. And he had a vision of the Klan as, as kind of an engaging men's club. On Thanksgiving Day, 1915, he marched a group of men, ghostly in white sheets, hoods, and masks, to the top of Stone Mountain, where they burned a cross. The cross was Colonel Simmons' own addition to the Klan lore. It, it just seemed to fit. As one historian noted, Colonel Simmons fell in love with the letter K, and he clothed his clan in an elaborate array of regalia, secret codes and handshakes, and plegals, clubs, claverns, and clan craft. Try to say that fast. His real breakthrough came when he teamed up with a cynical pair who turned his fraternity into a profit-making pyramid scheme sold by ruthless techniques of the then new science of public relations. They sold the Klan as a kind of macho response to white male egos that were threatened by a society they could no longer control, promising them raw power and the security of the mob. Some call the 1920s plan America's experiment with fascism. I think that is a very apt description. As Sinclair Lewis had predicted, Colonel Simmons' plan came carrying the cross and wrapped in the American flag. This sounds sort of familiar to me too. It was energized by local hatreds. Was your child afraid of Catholics or immigrants, Black people or gas women playing cards? The Klan had a remedy for all that. Let's get together and clean up these lawless towns. The KKK touted 100% Americanism and combined it with religious mysticism as symbolized by the burning cross, of course. Clan leaders, uh, leaders dispatched clegals, those are the salesmen, to clux entire states and organize claverns. People loved it, strange as it was. Clan membership exploded. Almost overnight, the leaders became millionaires, several times over, on $10 clan memberships and the markup of the sale of sheets. They even, <laughs> they even set up a factory so they could manufacture and sell sheets. Perhaps the most significant is that the 1920s Klan controlled Main Street in many places. That was the distinction. If you wanted to get ahead in many towns, you joined the Klan the way you might join the Rotary or the Kiwanis today. Across America, founding fathers and leading citizens proudly joined the Klan as a kind of civic duty. You know, there is plenty of ridiculous stuff in the story of the Roaring Twenties Klan. Remember this, it was organized first and foremost to make money. Until you know that behind the mask was growing the ugly face of the Night Riders with vigilante violence, intimidation, and murder. Founders purposely incorporated 2% of the rough stuff into their formula for success. As it turned out, Colonel Simmons had unleashed a tiger 
And at some point, he totally lost control of it. Unspeakable torture and even death threatened those who committed the most egregious offense. And what do you think that would be? You're in a clan town. What is the worst thing you could do, the most dangerous thing you could do to speak ill of the clan? People were subjected to really unspeakable atrocities and, and, and murders because they spoke ill of the clan. They didn't respect the clan. At its height, the entire towns were in its grip. It was truly a reign of terror. And it was wildly popular. It's impossible to know how many people were in the secret society, but experts I've read estimate that at its peak in the mid 1920s, the KKK had between 2.5 and 8 million members, which is a goodly slice of a nation that at that point had just 115 million people. With mask and hood, flag and cross, they marched silently through America's main streets in a ghostly white wave, thousands strong to the somber beat of a booming drum. For many, it was the place to be. In Florida, the Klan arrived shortly after the start of Reconstruction, right after the Civil War, when Democrats, Democrats plotted to use violence and terror to suppress Black votes. Thereafter, history records numerous examples of violence, torture, floggings, mutilations, and murders across Florida. Many of the outrages, but not all, were under the Klan banner. There were plenty of freelancing going on. Blacks and white Republicans were the favored targets. Between 1877 and 1950, more than 300 Black victims were lynched in Florida. Let's just let that sink in a minute. More than 300 Black victims were lynched in Florida, and they were among more than 4,000 nationally. Nowhere was the 1920s, 1920s Klan more powerful than in, of all places, Indiana, the Hoosier State. Around 1922, that would be 100 years ago this year, around 1922, the Klan sent an ambitious young Klegel to Indiana to clux the state. His name was David Curtis Stevenson. He was from my home state, Oklahoma. He was a blonde, blue-eyed charmer. He was the restless editor of small Oklahoma newspapers, given to leaving towns quickly, leaving debts, aggrieved enemies, and pregnant girls. They called him Steve. Steve turned out to be a political genius. Who knows where he got that wisdom? And his first contribution to history, number one, was leading the Klan into politics. He married the Klan with political uh, um, I forgot the word, but you get the idea with politics. Swiftly, deftly, he took over the Indiana Protestant Church, law enforcement, and the state's Republican Party. Steve had been a Democrat in, in, in Oklahoma, but the Republican Party was the one that happened to be in control of Indiana, so he became Republican. He, 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 was, he was not partisan. He would have, his, deal, his deal was power and, and money. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, political uh, philosophy. Within two years, Steve had become, two years, Steve had become the Indiana Grand Dragon in the Klan, and he was installing his own governor in Jackson, sealing the deal on a statewide Klan power sweep from the schoolhouse to the statehouse. I am the law in Indiana. Steve declared, and no one dared challenge him. Steve had created the model that the Klan could use to become a national political powerhouse, and they were on their way. Steve's story has lessons for today. Uh, I, I'd like to go into more of them, but I'll just, I'll just hit on a little bit at the top. But 
the more you learn about his political techniques, the more you recognize in, that they're in use today by some one of the authoritarians. Steve had the cunning mind of a Steve Bannon, but he was smooth as silk, a performance artist with a glad hand and a golden tongue. Steve's clan was different. It had a clean public face. Steve's clan was a family affair. The entire families frolicked to very large clan barbecues presided over by dutiful, sheeted clan wives, while little white hooded clan kids played hide and seek around their feet. Steve came from meager circumstances to put it mildly, but he had big ideas. Thanks to the clan, he became an overnight millionaire and he was living it up. He established his own Imperial Palace of the North in a silk stocking neighborhood named Irvington. And he yearned to establish himself among the highest class in Indianapolis, which by the way, they were now calling Clanapolis because he had so thoroughly taken over the town. He became the kingmaker at the National KKK. If you wanted something done in the Klan, you had to see Steve. And he began meeting with his friend Guts and Borglin. Hmm, Guts and Borglin, does that name ring any bells? Yeah. Soon he would be carving presidents on that Rushmore. But in the meantime, and, 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 and the uh, uh, panorama on Stone Mountain too, by the way. But in the meantime, he was meeting with Steve. They were scheming on how they would take over the, the US presidency. But uh, as part of it, they were gonna throw the whole thing into the House of Representatives, by the way. Steve made or broke politicians with a nod. He is the law, people said. If you cross him, he will crush you. You might say Steve controlled everything in Indiana except the Indianapolis Times, which was a scrappy little afternoon newspaper whose editorials roasted the Klan with sarcasm and scorn. The Times court reporter was a cheeky kid named John Niblack who was straight out of that old movie front page. But you know, his hot history accounts about the Klan are absolutely priceless. Steve, for his part, treated the press like a mosquito buzzing near his ear. He would just occasionally spot it and keep it going. In January, 1925, at the inauguration of Steve's Klan governor, he met a young woman who was everything he dreamed of a quiet reading teacher with an impe impeccable reputation from a fine old Indianapolis family. She was one of the locally revered Irvington girls. His neighbor, it turned out. Well, what do you know? Her name was Madge Oberholzer. He asked her out more than once. Now Steve's public persona was spotless but there were whispers behind the scenes about women and alcohol and, and Madge told Steve no. On the Ides of March, 1925, Steve kidnapped Madge, forced her on a train and brutally raped and mutilated her. On the return trip, she managed to procure poison and preferring death, to the shame of his attack, she took the poison. When she became violently ill, he refused to get medical aid and then just discarded her, bruised and torn, at home with her grieving parents. As Madge lingered gravely ill, she dictated a dying declaration to the family lawyer whose name was Asa Smith, telling him the whole story and implicating Steve. The county prosecutor was Bill Ramey. He, he, he was a young, new, young prosecutor, green, but he wasn't afraid of Steve. He fearlessly filed charges against Steve for kidnapping and rape. Ha, huh, I'll never go to trial, Steve told John Niblock. When Madge died, Ramey changed the charge to murder. Remy argued that Steve's crimes drove her to suicide. 
and that her death was in fact hastened by blood poisoning from human bites. Now the most powerful man in the state found himself in jail on trial for murder. Ha, I'll never be convicted, Steve said. Steve's sensational trial shocked the nation. How could it be that the white knight of the Klan, powerful and revered, was accused of such repulsive crimes? Reporters from around the globe camped out in the courthouse, and the public followed every uh, day's latest dispatch eagerly. The best of the stories, in my opinion, were from Guess Who, Indianapolis's kid reporter, the Indianapolis Times kid reporter, John Niblack. Every day he dictated long stories filled with exquisite details, such as the single tear cursing down the cheek of Madge's mother. Those stories, I'm an old reporter, and those stories were better than being there. They were magnificent stories. Ultimately, on November 6, 1925, a jury of Indiana farmers found Steve guilty of murder. I'll never serve. Steve told him it luck. But serve he did. David Curtis Stevenson was destined to spend most of the rest of his life in the Indiana penitentiary making chairs. But he did not go quietly. He thought that the Klingon and his political buddies would all come to his defense and that he'd get a pardon. When the Klan and his political friends didn't come to his defense, Steve unleashed his full treasure trove of clan secrets and scandals that he had hidden in black boxes throughout Indiana. Pow, 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 they were just like explosions. And like Samson, Steve brought down the house. I said that Steve's first contribution to history was bringing the, the clan into politics, marrying the clan, the clan in politics. And his second contribution to history was when his scandals shattered the public's crush on the Klan. Weeks before the verdict, the Klan had marched in Washington with a traumatic show of force, 30,000 strong. Then David Curtis Stevenson was revealed to be a metaphor for the Klan itself, a Jekyll and Hyde. Behind the jovial mask was a sadistic monster. When the truth about the Klan was loose, the public reaction was horror and revulsion. As time can, went on, it became clear that the Klan phenomenon had peaked. The KKK careened into a downhill slide. Opponents, who'd been quiet in many cases, but they suddenly found their tongues and they found their courage. And Everywhere, people now were speaking out against the Klan, declaring that, as a matter of fact, they've been against the Klan all along. Later in the decade, the Klan tried efforts at revival, abandoning their masks and changing their name to the Knights of the Greek Forest. Somehow it never caught on. It was finished on Main Street. By 1930, the Klan was down to 46,000 members. Never again would the KKK be a respectable organization. The Klan splintered and went underground, back into the back alleys, where it has never completely died out. Over the years, the spirit of the Klan was always lurking in the shadows, waiting for the right moment. Integration in the 1950s, voting rights in the 1960s, and again today, as white supremacists grab the public spotlight, violence is cruel, and the threat of fascism is back in America. So what can we learn from the curious case of the 1920s KKK? Ultimately, their own evil consumed both Steve and the Klan. If I needed to pick just one reason for the Klan's ruin, I would say it was the truth, told fearlessly and documented tirelessly by the newspapers and courageous writers of the day. The Klan was devastated by ordinary people, people like us, who fearlessly told the truth. 
people such as Madge Overholzer, her family lawyer, Asa Smith, and the county prosecutor, Bill Ramey. My favorite truth teller, you probably figured this out, was the kid reporter, John Niblack, who had, a, as a matter of fact, he had a distinguished career as a journalist, and then he became an Indiana judge and spent 32 years as an Indiana judge. And he wrote his own history book with his own unique version of the David Curtis's, Curtis Stevenson chapter in Indiana's history. As we think about this story, we can take away hope. I think hope is in short supply these days. I think we have a hope crisis. Uh, I, and I do think for all the seeminess and ugliness of this story, that it, it, it can give us hope. When the Klan ruled Main Street 100 years ago, eventually in city after city, people of goodwill triumphed. The good people of this nation rose up to survive the 1920s Klan, the 1929 crash, and the Great Depression. We rose up to confront evil on the world stage, and we won the Second World War. We soared into the space age with its challenges of globalism, mushrooming technologies, and the threats now to the very planet on which we live. We rose again to create the greatest democracy this world has ever known. You know, over the span of my 84 years, my generation has enjoyed the highest standard of living in history. I'm certain of that. I just pray the same for coming generations. Today, we have no shortage of challenges. I don't have to tell you that. Across the sweep of history, the divides that separate us today, that, that, that cause us so much worry, you know, it may just be a blip. And yet, in a very real sense, I think one by one, the cumulative weight of our divisions could sink us if we lose heart. The question of the hour is, what can we do? I have cleverly assigned the answer to my friend Steve. <laughs> Forgot to tell you that. But but before I turn the mic over to Stephen and, and stand by and watch, I do want to mention three little simple things, little simple steps that I think we that, that, that I can do. And in fact, you may already be doing all of them. First and foremost, if you haven't already done it, join the League of Women Voters. Yeah. A fine group of men and women who are banded together to empower voters and defend democracy. I mean, take, your, take yourself and give yourself a pat on the back, guys. <laughs> Second step is, and I do work on this, we can continue to grow in understanding. I love this quote from uh, the 17th century philosopher Spinoza. Um, Human actions are not to be ridiculed, feared, or hated, but rather to be understood. There is so much packed into that, in that for me. And there, there's another translation that is, is, is also a little instructive. Not to laugh, not to lament, not to curse, but to understand. And third, I want to celebrate what you're already doing. If you remember one thing I've said today, I hope you remember this. You know, we're engaged in the, in the battle of our time. Take heart. We can rise again. We did it then, and we can do it again. I may be fooling myself, I hope not, but as the free world draws together to support Ukraine, I wonder whether we're already turning a little corner in the battle of democracy against uh, autocracy. I hope so. Of course, the outcome is not assured. No question about that. And we are all called to do more, but we can build on what you're already doing. The things you're already doing make a difference, like grains of sand make a beach, and drops of water make a wave. You could be doing a lot of other things on your Saturday. The fact that you are here 
where we can all come together and learn from each other, speaks to your determination, your goodwill, and your grit. Thank you for all that you're already doing to support the rule of law and strengthen democracy. And thank you for your kind attention this day. Thank you, Ann. Uh, I read your book and I think what disturbs me most in your book is how easy it was for a small group of unscrupulous individuals to co-opt and utilize and build on people's existing prejudices for their own selfish ends. Without social media. Yep, yep. Yeah, without social media, yeah. That's, uh, that's upsetting. Uh, next present, Presentation is Stephen Pointer is going to present. He's going to talk to us. Stephen is the education creator, education curator, not creator, curator at the Holocaust Memorial Research and Education Center of Florida. His position is joint with the Orange County Public Schools, where he helps teachers and schools implement the Florida mandate for Holocaust education through collaborative teacher training direct student instruction and curriculum design. Prior to joining the Holocaust Memorial Center, Stephen served on the Commissioner of Education's Task Force on Holocaust Education. This afternoon, Stephen is gonna introduce a uh, conversational approach used successfully by Daryl Davis, a uh, black musician who has collected over 200 Klan robes in the last uh, 30 years. Stephen's gonna answer the question, what can we do today with tangible actions that help uproot prejudice, engage civil conversations to bring about positive change and overcome evil with goodwill. So Stephen, tell us how we take positive steps. That is a lot to follow up. And um, <laughs> following Anne, I'm going to tell you right now that I am not quite the eloquent speaker. Uh, my use in, uh, of humor is also probably going to be lacking. Uh, so I hope that you can bear with me as we go through today and talk about a few different things um, that I've gotten, but not by myself, uh, through this you know, uh, organization that I'm a part of. And at first, I'd like to start by thanking the League of Women Voters uh, and uh, Patton, as well as you know, all of you for showing up to, uh, today because this is really an amazing turnout. And, uh, and thank you all really for coming out today because usually um, you know, our mission at the Holocaust Center as we're, uh, you know, our mission statement is to use the lessons of the Holocaust uh, to build a just and caring community. It's free of anti-Semitism and all forms of bigotry and prejudice. That's a tall order. Um, makes for a difficult job as well. Every day we go in and there's a challenge. What is the relevance of events like the Holocaust? And actually we're talking about this small group of people who grew up, who, uh, built out the Klan. It sounds really similar to another group that uh, started just after the end of World War I as a small group of men who met in a beer hall uh, under the, uh, the NSDAP. Uh, as the, originally the German Workers' Party and eventually became known as the Nazi Party. Small group of men in a beer hall eventually became the dominant political party and was ultimately responsible for the death of millions, six million Jews, five million others, uh, as well as all those who died in World War II. Um, it starts small. And what we're looking at today is, is, is a, it's a, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. The changes we're trying to do, the answers are not simple. And we're in a world today where people want their answers now. I need a pill. I want something quick. Uh, and this is difficult. And it'll take a lot of patience and time. And to do that, I want you to introduce you to Daryl Davis. Has anyone here heard of Daryl? Wonderful. I had the privilege of meeting Daryl Davis um, back in October and hearing his story. I've, I've heard his story a number of times. 
but getting to sit and talk with him is just really quite uh, amazing because what he's done in his life to uh, really plant that seed of change is amazing. And rather than me sit here and tell you about what he's done, I'm gonna play a video uh, and actually introduce you to Daryl himself. So this is about a 10 minute video. Uh, and we'll, I'd like to, you know, to bear with us and, and I'll introduce you right now. Let's see if I can get this going right. Are we gonna do both? My name is Daryl Davis. I'm 61 years of age, born in Chicago. My parents were U.S. Foreign Service officers, and I spent a lot of time living overseas. My classes were filled with other kids from other countries within the international school. But when I would return home here, I was either in all black schools or black and white schools, and there was not the amount of diversity in my classroom. And racism was something that was very foreign to me. In fact, I never even heard the term. My first racist experience was 1968. I was 10 years old. I was one of two black kids in the entire school. And many of my friends were members of the Cub Scouts. So I joined the Cub Scouts. It was a lot of fun. And we had a parade. And my grandmother had uh, let me carry the American flag. Everything's went along smoothly. And then I was suddenly being hit, you know, with bottles and uh, soda pop cans and rocks, which I guess to breathe in the street. Now, because I had no precedent for this kind of behavior, I just assumed that the scouts were under attack. Most people don't like the scouts. I did not realize that I was the only scout under attack. <laughs> The first time in my life, my mother and father sat me down and explained to me what racism was. My 10 year old brain could not wrap itself around the idea. And I thought my parents were lying on April 4th, that same year. Stop. 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 Martin Luther King was assassinated. Oh, 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 Turn it up. Every negativity, burn, violence, and destruction, all in the name of racism. And it was then that I realized that my parents have not lied to me. This thing about racism does exist. But I didn't understand why. How can you hate me when you don't even know? 51 years, I'm going to answer that question. Bring it back. Bring it back. I graduated from music and went on to Howard University where I made in music. Music had become my profession. A study in race relations had become my obsession. And I educated myself about black supremacy, white supremacy, anti-Semitism, the Klan, the Nazis in Germany, the neo-Nazis over here. I had more knowledge as to how we could operate. And then country music had made a resurgence in our country. So I joined the country band. I was the only black person in the band. Usually the only black person where we would play. And there was a bar in Frederick, Maryland, my first time in there. I came off the stage on brick, and I felt somebody put their arm around my shoulder. And I turned around, and this white gentleman, man, and I really like your old music. I said, thank you, I appreciate that. I shook his hand, and he wanted to buy me a drink. And he clinched my glass and cheers me. Then he says, you know, this is the first time I ever sat down and had a drink with a black man. And I said, why? And at first he didn't answer me, he got to look down at the tabletop. And put his elbow and said, tell him, tell him, tell him. He looked back at me casually and he said, I'm a member of the two bucks fine. The guy gave me his phone number and he wanted me to call him anytime I was to return to this bar with this band because he wanted to bring his friends. Meet Klansmen and Klansmen to see 
this black guy. But you know what, Jerry Lee Lewis. <laughs> brought Atlanta together with a black guy. After that, it dawned on me, Daryl, the answer to your question has been plaguing you. How can you hate me? You don't even know me. Who better to ask than someone who would join an organization that has over a hundred year history of practicing hating people who do not look like them and people who do not believe as they believe. <laughs> My name is Scott Shepard. I'm 59 years old. I was born and raised in Indian Island, Mississippi. I came from a very dysfunctional family. My dad became a very violent alcoholic. I had low self esteem. I didn't like myself. I didn't like anyone, actually. I had a lot of anger in me. I was looking for just a place in life, something. And actually, the main thing, I guess, that's what the world would love, because I didn't feel that at home. The racial atmosphere was very tense due to the civil rights movement. It was one of those cities, railroad tracks that run through the middle of town. Whites lived on one side and blacks lived on the other. From the years of 17 growing up, I was involved with not just the Ku Klux Klan, but other white supremacist groups. But as soon as I took the oath, had an immediate feeling of importance. I spent very close to 20 years of my life in the white supremacist movement. I had this little bitty voice in the back of my head all the time. I mean, from, from day one, wondering, saying, do you really believe the things that you're doing? My mother was not racist. My dad was not racist. In fact, I was raised by a black lady. She actually worked for my grandmother. My mother was adopted. I loved her, and she loved me. She loved my entire family, and all oh, that was still in the back of my mind. I was starting to realize, you know, what I was doing was wrong, and I had no friends. I, I did even contemplate suicide. I was very depressed, and in that dark period, of not knowing what to do. We should have been talking about this kind of thing for a long time and bringing some kind of understanding about the racial divide. I reached out to Daryl after seeing him on television. Daryl just popped into my life. Just the actions of him responding, I started feeling better inside, and I started having a little, just a little bit of hope. Daryl extended his hand. And Actually, just extended his heart to me when we became brothers. And I withdrew from grace. Daryl saved my life, too, because I had lost relationships with my family. One of my twin boys started picking up you know, the things that I was doing inside the Ku Klux Klan. And I'm very fortunate that I got out or changed my life before my son got involved. My relationships became positive and then we had to start developing another relationship with my daughter and I'm able to visit with my granddaughters. I didn't even know them, but we got a great relationship with them now. I learned a lot from Daryl. We found a lot of things in common and I mimicked Daryl to try to do the same thing and try to help some of these people that are involved. If it wasn't for Daryl, I'd still be stuck in a hole and not knowing what to do, and I couldn't help anyone. How do you feel today, a black man holding this road of living? Well, actually, you know, I no longer need that. I no, no longer need that road and that hood to feel powerful for where I'm at now. It means a lot to me that you have, bro, 
because of the, the relationship that you and I have built. I gave up something that really made me feel important and made me feel like I was someone and I gave it to you. I don't need it anymore. I mean, I gave up that life. You are I, not this person? I am not that person anymore. I don't miss that world at all. And not only does it uh, mean a lot to me, you know it means a lot to my family too. And you are our family too. I don't know what I'd do without you. We are a family. And this family is one that's going to last. You bet it. Oh, you know it is. gonna go past just because I know it was out for some. Um, has anyone ever seen that video before? Um, so uh, there have been variations of uh, Daryl's story and I got the privilege of meeting Daryl and sitting down with him for a night and talking with him. And for a man who's gotten over 200 members of the clan to hand over their robe, you know, I mean, this is through conversation, through connection, and we live in a very polarized society right now. We do. I mean, how many of you avoid conversations with people as soon as it turns racial in discussion? I have done it before. Uh, or avoid family members who think differently than you. They, I mean, I don't call. Uh, it's, it's more common than we'd like to believe. I'll give you an example on this uh, here, the, the polarization. We had a group that came into the museum and one, we've had people ask, why do you have this in the Holocaust Museum? Why do you have an exhibit? We call it like Conversations for Change. We actually have a little bit of the history of prejudice, racism, and the rise of rights, white supremacy in the United States, uh, and a little bit of history of the Klan as well as existing groups to build that foundational understanding of Daryl's story. And this, the story is about Daryl Davis. The story is about what he's done, and then what can you do uh, once you hear these type of stories? How, what tools has he used? And they're just relationship tools that we've lost. We don't talk to one another anymore. We don't listen. We're all experts because we have Google in our pockets. We know everything. All the kids that I talk to know everything, except when they want to take a test. Um, and um, you know, it's 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 really it makes it difficult to want to have a discussion with someone, especially uh, you come to it and we we but we all know everything. I I I'm waiting for you to finish. So I can start talking and tell you how wrong you are. And I haven't listened to anything that you've had to say. We don't come with a genuine interest. And Daryl says to me, he says, I said, how do you do it? How do you go in and you know, have these conversations with people who you know? This isn't just like talking to someone who thinks a little different than you or has slightly slight racial tendencies making little comments. And I'll give you a story about that in a minute. You're talking to members of the KKK. You are going into, he goes to rallies. He goes to rallies to, he gets invited to go to Klan rallies. He's been to cross lightings. And I say cross lighting, different from cross burning. A cross burning used to scare people off or a lighting at an actual Klan rally where they take turns lighting the cross. And at our center, if you come in, we actually have Scott Shepard's robe and it has Part of the sleeve is burnt out. We actually had a sleeve burnt from one of the cross lightings. And now people who go through it and they'll go, good. Should have burned him down completely. And I just the other day, we had a discussion saying, you know, if you've been a member of the clan, are you worthy of redemption? Should, should, this, should this even be done? Do we need to do this? You joined the clan. You joined a hate group. And... That's a that's a very personal thing as far as your opinion. I mean, I've got, you know, as far as how do we heal division and what do we do with people who join these outright, these, these groups like the KKK? Because not everyone who's bigoted or prejudiced has joined the Klan, just so you know. They, all, they don't all wear white hoods and they don't all dress up and go into little, you know, in little uh, fraternal meetings and they're not all skinheads either. Some of them are right next to us. Some are at places where we work. Some of them are members of our family. Uh, so, you know, what is the, what is the answer and is it a simple answer? And Daryl also says, you know, it's, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. You're not going to get a simple answer. And he says, this is why I do it. If I have a chance to convince someone to leave an organization like the Klan, who better to convince other 
members of the clan or young people who might be thinking of joining a hate group not to join than a member, a former member of a white supremacist group or might have an impact on their family to maybe not pass down that hate to their children. You know, that's why he does the idea of building and building a bridge. And not everyone agrees with Daryl. There are interviews with Daryl Davis uh, after the Baltimore after the Baltimore riots, where there were two young men who actually argued with him and did not like what their, what his uh, goals were and did not agree with what he was doing. The answers aren't simple. He has members of, on top of that. He has members of the Klan who've threatened his life for taking members. He has many alarm systems up and tells stories of like a potential that people have tried to invade his home and tried to break in. He goes, it's difficult, challenging. Every day is a challenge because when you're talking to someone, you have to realize they only know what they know. You only know what you know. It's such a simple phrase, but it's the truth. And, uh, you know, and we approach it like he, and he told a story, you know, and he started off by saying, I want you to hear this. Ignorance breeds fear. Fear breeds hatred. Hatred breeds destruction. Education and exposure are the solution to ignorance. And we've kind of moved past that, whereas, you know, the idea of trying to learn, where we already say, well, I already know. Are we willing to learn? Are we willing to take that next step, to have that conversation? And Daryl said, I approach it like this. Every conversation is one. I come to every conversation with a level of curiosity. And, and, uh, and he also says, and I think of it like this when I'm talking to someone. Imagine when a little kid has come to you and they've told you they've just been to a magic show. And they saw this magician cut, saw this woman in half. You're the parent or the grandparent. And you say, no, you didn't actually see anybody cutting one in half. That child knows they saw a woman get cut in half. I saw a woman get cut in half. That's, that is what it is. How do you challenge that perception? If I want you to think differently, how do I challenge that? And so Daryl said, what I would do is I'd start by saying, well, isn't it possible that? A little conversation, you know, kind of break a hole in what you, your reality, how you formed your worldview. Is it possible that the magician might have had someone in the audience who was a participant? Is it possible that... No, that person worked for the magician and that there was something in the box, another pair of legs. Just the idea of, I want, I'm trying to shatter that illusion that you've got, but I want to do it in a way that you can accept. But they have to trust you. And that's where Daryl says you have to build that trust. You have to establish that trust. Another, uh, if you've if you ever come to our center, uh, we recently had Pardeep Singh, Kalika, and Arno Michaelis. Michaelis. And uh, Pardeep uh, is a Sikh. And his father was killed in 2012 in Wisconsin when a white supremacist went into his congregation and murdered his father and congregants who were worshiping that morning. Arnold Michaelis is a founded as a founding member of one of the largest white supremacist organizations that still exist in the United States today called the Hammerskins. How are these two people together? And, uh, and the, they wrote a book called The Gift of Our Wounds. And the idea is because, because uh, Arno has actually turned a page and he did actually shortly after this event had happened saying, I can't be part of this type of organization anymore. And he would kind of tell, he tells a different story because you know, you'll hear everything from you were abused. Uh, they were people who weren't abused. You will hear all sorts of different things, but uh, Arno has made it his mission to try to speak to people and not everyone, you know, wants to hear his story, but he actually went into a Sikh temple. And actually, this is this, I got the, these, these gentlemen are really amazing. They were a Sikh biker gang. Yeah. <laughs> and they're great. So they go around actually uh, talking about religious tolerance and making connections with one another. And they sat there and, uh, and Arno sat in the temple. We sat on the floor and we ate some really amazing uh, spicy food that burned my mouth for the next few hours. And luckily no one had to hear me talk anymore. Um, but uh, I asked him about forgiveness. I said, do you think, I said, just speaking of it, do you think you're worthy of redemption and forgiveness? And he said, no. He said, I don't, I don't expect anyone to forgive me. I don't expect anyone to understand. He goes, but I, I hope everyone understands that I'm not that person. And what I want to do is I want to stop that spread of hate. 
That's why I speak. I don't do it for money. I don't do it for notoriety. I do it because I, I want to do it. And I frequently, you, you see all these places where I speak, but you don't always see everywhere that I speak with the idea of speaking with you know other groups, the idea that he could speak with a youth group and convince young people who might be looking to join a hate group. Uh, he said that's that usually people who are like that on average, they are in a moment of despair. They're looking for someone to blame. You heard this in number in clan stories. You hear this in Nazi Germany. You know, what were they going through when the, when the Nazis, when they actually during the 20s in the Weimar Republic, when the Nazi party was uh, before when it began to grow in the early 20s, well, as soon as the economy got better, guess what? Membership declined. The Nazi party membership declined. And then as soon as 29 hit, that's when it spiked back up again. When people are in despair, people are looking for hope, they're looking for answers, they're looking for someone to listen, and they're looking for someone to blame. Scapegoating. Uh, and we see this, and it's been repeated in experiments all over again. But you know, we have to have a, a, some type of way to build a bridge to connect with people. These are some things that Daryl mentions are the ingredients to building bridges. And one of them is you have to be authentic. You have to be real with your conversation. You can't come at someone also with an expectation. And you need to be willing to find a commonality. You know, in Daryl's story, he says, music brought him and a Klansman together. That was their commonality. We frequently like to make, say that it's us and them. You know, you hear that, you hear if you're, uh, I mean, honestly, we, I, I've done it. You know, someone who's a member of the Republican Party, I've got an assumption of exactly how you are. I know you. Or the Democrat Party or this, I, you know, I, I make an assumption based on who you are. I'm not looking for a commonality. I'm looking for a way to disagree with you. I'm honest about my shortcomings and, uh, and uh, you know, my own ignorance. And uh, this is coming from someone who was, I was raised in a household where you were expected that you were going to... Uh, be very far right leaning and probably expected to be a little bit prejudiced in your commentary uh, with my mother and father. So how do I find a commonality? Am I willing to? Come with every conversation with a genuine curiosity, not with wanting to espouse and tell, but to connect and find out why do you think the way that you do? Like, I really want to know. I want to know what, where, what created your worldview. Tell me about your life. We don't always want to know that. Again, we want to talk and tell, not listen. And I am so very guilty of that very often. Now, I, I want to find out more. Everyone wants to be heard. Everyone wants to, you know, the idea of, you know, joining, well, whether you join the clan or whether you join a gang, groups like that and white supremacist groups prey on people who are disconnected, disenfranchised, need to belong. I'll give you something to belong and I'll give you someone to blame and someone to hate. Listening, we were, uh, my mother used to say this to me all the time. You were, you know, born with two ears and one mouth. Learn why. <laughs> Thank you, mom. I still haven't learned. Um, and patience. We are in a age of convenience. I want my information now. I want it quick and I want it to be done and over with. And I want the solution now. I'm that bad too. I could think I can look things up and I can become an expert on something in five minutes. When we have a conversation, do we have the patience to listen? Do we, are we able to sit there and actually have a conversation at a genuine interest? This is the tattoo that Arno put on his fingers after, and I love this picture, but love wins. And you know, you, know, you could say it's corny, but he really believes it. He says you have to come from a place. He says you have to come from a place of love and actual caring. I have to want to be able to bridge. With, I have to want to build a bridge with you. The goal isn't to change their mind right away. The goal is to plant a seed. Not many of you will not ever speak with a Klansman, but everyone here will probably speak with someone who has a racist or anti-Semitic view. And what do you imagine that dialogue would look like? In Orlando recently, we've had white supremacist groups on our streets. And this wasn't, a, and, and working at the Holocaust Center, 
We've had groups pull up in large white vans holding signs. We have children that go to the JCC next door that are in a school in the Jewish Academy. These children are not above fifth grade. It means these are young kids, young students, and there are people, people standing outside of our, outside of our uh, center on the street holding up signs that I wouldn't even repeat what they said, they're so foul, screaming at these children. When I shared the pictures online to kind of say, this is what we have, this is what we're fighting. I had friends of mine who would say, oh, this is some kind of propaganda you're putting up. This is a bunch of garbage. Where'd you, where'd you find this doctored photo? On my phone, with my camera in my phone. I was there, I'm having to actually defend that this isn't something I made up. Why do you think I would make this up? Now, yes, it, was this a fringe group? Sure. French groups can cause a lot of damage. It only takes a few people to do something horrifying. It only takes one person to do something horrifying. Shortly after, in Waterford Lakes Plaza over by UCF, we had a group that was actually standing on the street, not just holding up signs, but waving Nazi flags, yelling and saluting Heil Hitler directly wasn't implicit, it wasn't implied, it was what it was, yelling and screaming at people. And there was a woman standing across on the street with just a sign that said, God is love. And they were screaming at her, horrible racial epithets. Are these people probably as approachable as I would like? Probably not. This is, this is not gonna walk up and go, I'd like to have a talk with you and find out. <laughs> that, that might be a little difficult. So we're gonna start simple. And, uh, and I'll tell you my, my uh, you know, we see these people, that's not, you know, and I, I don't encourage students to don't go out and find a clan member to talk to, I, you, know, uh, you know, but when you're in school and you're talking to people or when you're in your job or, or your neighbors are talking to your family, you know, how are you gonna have that conversation? I'm gonna give you two brief examples. One was at work and I was teaching a class and I have a very good friend of mine who I always thought was fairly progressive. He, he was a ceramics professor, very nice man, very opinionated, always got to tell me what I needed to hear, whether I wanted to hear it or not. And one day he comes up, he'd come visit me at lunch, he'd go, he'd go, Pointer. That's why I was Pointer. I never had a first name in my actual, in my job. <laughs> and he'd say, he'd say, Pointer, he goes, why are your kids always coming to me depressed? He gives me your Holocaust class. He goes, this is a, he said, take a guess. <laughs> this is, yeah, take and uh, and so I think he thought it was gonna be funny. And he goes, "Well, instead of making them, instead of uh, you know being that all depressed, why don't you bring them down to my classroom for a field trip for a tour of my kilns?" I I had to take a pause and think of what I was gonna say next that wasn't gonna start a big argument and an issue and. Um, I said, so exactly why? And here's the thing is I can take a joke. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a funny person. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to, that, that is not a joke. Um, and that is, a, that is you know, uh, something that is really common. And I'd say, why do you think this is funny? It's, it's, and he said, this was his response. It's not like anybody in your class is Jewish. I said, and how do you know? I'm just curious. He said, and whether that's the truth or not, why does that matter? I, mean, I said, I, and I had to bring back because I've got this attitude, of course, I'm, I'm not coming off very like, you know, uh, curious about why he formed his opinion. I'm coming across as what the heck, you're an educated individual. You're supposed to be an educator here at this school and you are the person that is talking to our children and what are you espousing uh, in your class when people aren't watching? And you think that this is funny. And he, he said, well, he goes, I, he goes, I don't know. I said, well, you know, this girl, young, her name is, uh, Esther, Esther Lima. I said, you know what Esther's actual last name is? Do you ever pay attention? Because she's in your class as well. Esther Lima Carfunkelstein. I said, Esther's Jewish. She's from Venezuela. She's Jewish. I, I had no idea. Did you take the time to sit and ask her about her, you know, herself? Did you get to know your students? Do you have a conversation and find out who they are, what they what they are? I said, her family actually left the Pale of Settlement, which is uh, Eastern Europe, Western Russia, uh, where they would live. They actually had left generations before, immigrated to Venezuela, and had fled Venezuela uh, from some of, you know, 
some of the things that were falling apart there and came to our country, I said to her, and she's actually has a, a good number of her family died in the Holocaust. And she tells her story. I've, I've talked to her in class. I said, so I, I really hope you haven't said things like this in class, in your class, because if the students are talking about my class, is there a chance that he's making jokes about it or making light of it? And I, I said, I, I, you need to learn more about this. And I was waiting for him to be a little more contrite. I'm sorry, that was rude. I, 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 you know, I really should know better. You'd expect that from someone who claims to be a progressive individual, wouldn't you? Um, I didn't get that. I got, it's not that big of a deal, calm down. So then I had to go to the school board, uh, which amounted to him getting censured because I tried to have my conversation. I tried to do my piece and I tried to do the right thing. Um, but it didn't go the way I needed to. And it was a, and it was something that I felt was affecting people drastically. So the next piece that what we're going to get to is, you know, how do you have these conversations and how do you actually, you know, talk to people around you? And I hope you're all ready to talk because I, we'd like for you to actually talk. And this is how do we begin? Everyone was handed a piece of paper. Everyone's handed a piece of paper. On that paper, there's a question on the front. The side actually says question on it. And I was trying to be really explicit. If you did not get one, please raise your hand so one can be brought to you. We have a couple of people who, folks who did not get. Yes. Okay. Well, this is okay. So what I'd like you to do, if you can, uh, I'd like you to turn to someone around you and actually ask one of those questions and see if they're willing to actually have a conversation. You don't have to, but I'd really like to see if there's audience time where you can actually ask each other questions. If you have a question in your hand, just ask the person next to you that question. This is, and kind of see how comfortable or uncomfortable you are in, in having this discussion. Just like a couple, couple of minutes. It didn't play the video. I'm going to control it from back here. I'm almost hesitant to uh, to start talking. Back to the front, uh, just for a moment, give that loud sound. 
We want to tell you what we get the QA session so we don't go over and have gone over a little bit. My school is not like that. Who got? Hello, 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 hello. Yeah, everyone, we'd like to get. Uh, I just want to wrap things up with this. Did you find the conference? Did you find the questions interesting? I, I, the, I know, I know. There's no time. It's my fault. I apologize. But hey, this is the beauty of this exercise. Go home. Use it on your neighbors. Use it on a friend. Use it on someone else. You don't have to just use it here. The way the questions are structured, and again, is so you can use them anywhere with anyone. And it's the, it starts a conversation. It's not threatening. It's not telling you you're bad. It's be self-reflective. And I hope you're able to get that out of the questions and to use them in the world, not just here as an exercise in, you know, in this meeting. That's the intention. So uh, if it helps you, wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand everything back over to Lou so I can stop talking now. Yeah. First of all, thank you, Steve. And hopefully uh, some of these ideas we can use in our discussion and, uh, and to future actions. Before we open the floor for discussion, we go over quickly a few ground rules. First, if you want to speak, raise your hand. There are women from the league in the aisles. They will give you a ticket with a number on it. And when you're, I don't know where our little number signs are, but we have our little number signs up here. And it's sort of like Publix Deli, but not quite. When your number is ready, come on down. Uh, we'll alternate back and forth so everybody has a pretty much equal chance. Uh, we will give preference to first time speakers. So if you want to speak a second time, we may ask you to wait while the first time speakers get a chance. Please try and keep your comments to under two minutes. We have a lot of people who are in in interested in talking. When you get to two minutes, I won't cut you off, but I'll kind of give you a let's wrap it up quickly kind of comment. Please speak to the entire audience, unless you're asking David or Anne a question. I'm going to try and avoid having back and forth kind of debates. Please, please try and distinguish facts from opinions. Everyone's entitled to their own set of opinions, not their own set of facts. If you're giving facts or opinions that are not yours, tell us where you got them from. I don't have any problem with that. We are, the league is politically uh, nonpartisan. Let's try and stay that way. And finally, let's be respectful of all those comments and questions and opinions. Stephen said it, but it's true. The quickest way to get someone to stop listening to you is to tell them you're wrong. Remember, we can disagree without being disagreeable. So do we have any speakers yet? Anybody? Raise your hand and get a ticket there. I'm going to bring this over here. Hang on, hold it if you need it. Okay, do we have a? Okay, please. On the left, we have a. On my left, your right. I don't know. Please go ahead. What is your first name? My first name is Ray. Thank you. Um, I, I think I, what I want to do is really uh, ask for some way of keeping the enthusiasm or the initiative going um, personally for talking with others who have such diverse views from your own or make comments that in some fashion um, you feel the need that you want to discuss it with them. Um, I think what I'm talking about is, you know, how many folks of color will say, you know, we're kind of tired of being, having to be the teachers of others of what it's like to be black. Um, it's a two-way street. So my question is, you know, for how does one keep their, 
their uh, personal motivation to continue that desire to talk to your friends and neighbors who make comments that are clearly either anti-Semitic or racist or whatever, um, and not at some point just throw your hands up and say, you know, I'm tired of having to keep dealing with folks like you and I'd just rather not do it. You know, just like you said, how many people don't talk to their family or don't talk to their neighbors because of that? Because we're kind of tired <laughs> at a certain point. Stephen or Ann, would you get a comment? I can, I can give you my just a, a, a brief on uh, you know I think it's very personal and very individual. There's not a there's not a magic answer for that. That goes back to the the marathon, not a sprint, and also the patience because it, it is exhausting. I'm talking about the Holocaust and racial issues every day. You don't think I go home and pass out at six o'clock and want to fall asleep from exhaustion? Uh, uh, it's, it's it's daily. But it, I know that if it has an impact, you know, my last image is actually, you ever heard the starfish story, the starfish on the beach? Yes. You know, uh, yeah, it's got the child with the starfish. I made a difference for that one. If you make that difference for that one, that's all that matters. It doesn't have to be everyone. It can be exhausting. Daryl will say he has not gotten every member of the clan to or white supremacist group to recant. He's been beat up. He's been punched. It is, it's not a, it's not a magic pill. It's, it's a, it's a marathon, and it requires, and also, who can you have that conversation with? You have to pick and choose. This person's willing to come to the table. That's my thoughts. Is it has to be, you know, they have to be willing to at least start that commonality discussion, and and then build on it from that. Then it's how you carry yourself. Stephen, I wonder if part of that is finding another topic to begin a conversation and then coming back to it. Sure, that like that, and like what Daryl said, that you know the commonality, something that is not device, something that connects you with that person. So then they that builds that trust. Please. That's not you don't turn that mic on. Button on the side. <coughs> Sorry. I have a comment and a question. The comment is. The comment, the comment is, I would highly recommend reading the 1619 Project. Um, we learned a lot today about the Ku Klux Klan. It is, uh, it's so important to read what happened as a result of it. We think we know, we don't. It is a remarkable book. Read the expanded version. It's on Amazon and it's a blue cover. Uh, we'll work so much. Get a little to the microphone again, Marshall. I'm trying, but it, it, there's Try it now. Okay, this, the question is to see us. Uh, we're aware of some of the uh, laws that are being passed in the state of Florida regarding education that makes students uncomfortable. Surely what you teach makes students uncomfortable. You wouldn't be doing your job if you weren't doing that. Um, how are you, how are you dealing with that? Yeah. Have you had problems as a result that people have, I mean, Lots of medication. <laughs> pain relievers, people. Pain relievers. Uh, so no, uh, you're right. You know, I you mentioned actually in my little my little bio piece. I uh, you know Florida was one of the first states, uh, the first group of states to actually passed a Holocaust mandate, and that was years years ago. And there are you know issues with that, but the idea of you know, teaching about subjects, I think it's the how. Uh, it's it's a, it, and it's a game. You always have to play it in a, such a way where I'm teaching you, but I have to stick. To, I try to always make sure to stick to the facts. If we have issues mentioned, you know, and mentioned uh, the Oshkosh massacre. This is a difficult history. It's a hard history. It is a fact. It is not. Uh, there's no debating it, but it's sticking to that, and then also uh, helping other teachers with that appropriateness and age and what are you trying to do? I'm not gonna send home pictures of the death camps with uh, mangled bodies to, you know, with seven-year-olds. I'm not gonna send pictures home of lynchings 
uh, to you know seven and eight year olds is not not an, not appropriate. What is my learning? What is the goal at that day? I mean, I'm trying to build empathy. I'm also trying to build tolerance, educate about tolerance, and then have them learn the history. It's it's giving educators the right tools and ways that you're trying to because that's the other angle you mentioned about the issues in the state. There are teachers who are throwing their hands up saying, I can't anymore because every time I say something, there's a parent who's responding and getting me in trouble with the school board because they think I'm indoctrinating the children. So I stop and I stick with the benchmark or the state standard and I just go teach line by line and rather than educating and teaching about critical think teaching critical thinking skills to younger people, we're just like, here's your timeline and your facts, have a nice day, which is why most students say history is boring. Because that's it. Thank you. Please. I uh, heard a talk the other day by a psychologist. The talk was based how do you talk to people in a country so diverse as we do? People think you can't say you're a Democrat in the, in the neighborhood I live because people just want to talk to you again. Um, and he came up with a good technique. And he said, look, it's no use getting into one of these factual debates. Don't try and argue facts with facts because you just get a deadlock. And facts have never changed anybody's mind. But he said, what his technique is, is to ask questions. Well, why can you explain more about your point of view? Where does that come from? And I was doing some research on all things Brexit. And I watched a very skilled radio talk show use this technique. And you get people on and you say, well, why do you, why do you want Brexit? Why do you want to leave the common market? And it always start with some high for or they're taking our jobs away. We can't afford to have these people here. Uh, they, they use our social facility. You know, they try and argue facts. And you say, well, I don't like the regulations that these people do. Uh, the common the European Union gets. And so give me an example of a regulation that's affecting them. And of course, they never could. And in the end, he boiled it down to always the same thing. But what, what am I, what is it? I just don't like going into a pub and hearing foreign accents and foreign voices and people of a different color. And I thought it was a very good technique. What do you think? That's, a, that's actually amazing. That's a very good technique. I think and, and it kind of plays into the part with we Daryl's mentioning about curiosity. Like you're trying to say, I'm trying to show them I have an interest in you know what you're saying, tell me more. And you get them to eventually possibly tell you, you know, what their real motivations are. Okay, we've got the speaker over here. A moment, or the question. Someone? Anyone wants a mic? Anywhere? Come up. Gentlemen. Fine. We'll go to the other side and we'll come back. Please try and back and forth, please, sir. Okay. Um, the last speaker may have started to answer my question. My problem is. My best buddy from high school, um, I tried to have a, a, a discussion with him and he just sort of all of a sudden came out of, I don't know, he had this thing about people were always calling him racist and it was a big thing for him. I couldn't figure out where he was coming from and I tried to argue facts of it. And so things like, uh, said, uh, you know, uh, Reagan went, he said, uh, there was this, uh, the um, welfare queen, you know? And he said, well, there's more than one. <laughs> how, how do you argue with someone who doesn't have some of those basic facts? So I'm trying to think of how I can ask questions of him, and frankly, I'm, I'm at a loss. So back to you. Well, I actually had that great answer over here. That was already, that's actually, you know, it's, it's that, that level of curiosity. I think, I think that explanation of just that, that discussion point, getting them to talk and eventually saying, hey, even getting people to analyze their own reasoning, you know, even no matter how simple it is, can you analyze, you know, explain to me why and more, and you might not like what you're hearing, but are you allowing them to speak so that way it can help them maybe hear their own voice and what they're saying? Please. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm too short for the place. <laughs> uh, I, let me, before I say this, let me just say that I know that this, what I'm going to say often gets responses of like, oh, you're just a bleeding heart liberal and 
you're out of touch with reality. Okay, so I, I've answered for you. But, and I'll tell you what the source of what I'm going to say is that for 35 or 36 years or something like that, I've been a, a mental health counselor, still am. And I believe that underneath all of this stuff is something that's just so basic. And we saw it in the, in the one video. Right now, I'm working with a 16, 15-year-old who's attempting to get out of a gang and a 19-year-old who has recently gotten out of a cult. And both of these young men, you know, they, they're young enough to tell me the truth, I guess. I don't know. But they all say, I was just looking for a place to belong. And, you know, I, if you're 16 or 19, you might have one response to that. Or, or But if you're 70 or 50 or something, you might have a different response, but there's no different response. People, if we go into conversations with people thinking about good and bad people, then we're never going to have these conversations. I just look at everybody as a potentially wounded person who wants to be listened to, and amazing conversations uh, result from that. Thank you. <laughs> One of the things that I found is I can set boundaries. We have friends we go out to dinner with every few months, and he and I are about as far apart politically as you can get. Um, and we've said right up front as he starts something, I said, we're not going to talk about that tonight, period. We will then talk about other things, and eventually we'll wander back occasionally to a milder version of that. So we'll find something we agree on. And then maybe that'll let us talk about some other things as well. But you, you try and avoid that immediate confrontation because that's getting you nowhere. We have, anybody else? Yes, yes please. I, uh, well, thank you very much for bringing up my stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Mike is an on. All right. Yes. Well, I'd like to thank everyone who came here and the organizers. To me, this is a good starting point to carry on a conversation. I, I, I experience your question. I experience that every day of my life. I uh -oh. The battery's going out on that, I'm afraid. Yes, I look. Yeah. I'll run back and forth. I'm good. <laughs> yes, I confirm that question. I look different. I speak different. I sound different. And I experience that it is painful. But it gave me strength to say, I can prove to you what I am. And what I learned from it in life is everyone has a story. And I practice that every day of my life. I try to listen to everyone. It could be a different point of view from me, but I learn something. Oh, they think that way. Well, maybe it makes sense to them. And maybe it does. That's what we have seen on, on TV. So I just want to thank everyone for bringing this up. Thank you. Anyone else? Do we have a? Okay. Again, I, um, I want to thank you all for doing this. Uh, my name is Jackie, and I think personally, I think we're all part of the same human family. So regardless of what we look like or where we come from, there are so many things we actually have in common. And, and I think for me, at least, when I discover somebody has this a vehement point of view, very different from my own. Um, I'm trying to focus on what do we have in common? And I know I had a neighbor and she reached out to me because she's a widow and I'm a new widow. And it was very lovely and I'm responding to her 
And then we go, she started with some things that were topics very, that we have very different perspectives. And I want, there's a part of me that wants to say, well, I really don't want to deal with that at all. And I'm, that's what I'm here with is the divisive. But I'm thinking what's important is I want to make sure that I do make, have plenty of time with her because I know we have a lot in common. And that's what I want to focus on. I think that I mean, we heard this. We need to listen. I love those things. But I think if focusing on what we have in common and even Lou's example. You can enjoy being with people because there's a lot of things you can like about one another and still respect disagreeing. And that just modeling being respectful and listening in spite of not agreeing, isn't that also part of what democracy is? We can have different opinions and still be okay. Thank you, Jackie. <laughs> Pam, Pam, did you get a little closer to that microphone? My name is Pam. I joined the Legal and Voters in Tampa, Florida in the 70s. I was a member in St. Petersburg in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s. I see on the brochure, it's all about voting. I wonder what are we going to do to go out and speak to our neighbors, to our families and our neighbors about voting rights? That's a big thing with me. That's what we promote in the league, voting rights. And I think that uh, we can do the voting rights. That's a form of racism. People are being kept from voting, redistricting, all these things. Let's keep people from voting. Especially people of color. We don't want them coming to the polls. You're, you're, we're losing you. We don't want people of color coming to the polls. What are we going to do? How, how brave are we to speak up to those neighbors who don't want to talk to us? <laughs> okay. Anyway, that's my big thing is we can put civil rights. I worked in Pinellas County government for 10 years. I saw gerrymandering in polls on the system. I saw all of a sudden on election day, you can't get to your polling place. There's a big construction project. I saw people not being, especially people of color, not being able to get to the school. I've seen all this. I just want to know, are we going to put our talk or walk or our talk is, how are we going to get, stop this voting rights tragedy? That's my question. Thank you. I, I hate to say it, but We've wandered a little off the subject. It is a critical issue. No, I agree. But you're right. It is, it is unfortunately a, a racial issue, a, a, a divisive issue. I don't have an answer in this discussion at the moment to where we're going with that. Thank you for the question and raising our consciousness. Please. Good afternoon. My name is Tommy. I'm from and I'm, um, I'm in here in the villages, and I've learned a lot since I've been here because I've been, I've lived in Michigan and in a Jewish community. And my Jewish neighbors were able to explain a lot to me. Baptized Catholic from the South for years and then in Ohio, raised in Ohio, moved to Michigan as an adult, and then here as an adult. Uh, for 79 years, I've been a bit confused about a lot of things. <laughs> However, I'm learning to listen better as the day goes on. There's so many issues that you have to address. But what I do find is that my neighbors and my neighborhood is changing very, very quickly. Uh, we had five people on my street that passed away this past year. Wow. So the neighborhood is changing. Uh, I'm willing to, and my new neighbors want to be introduced and uh, maybe have a, 
uh, driveway party <laughs> so that we can meet each other. And we all want the same thing. We have so much in common. And I think the conversation can start with what we have in common. If it's no more than exchanging some plants or talking about, uh, of course, we all have grandkids. I'm talking about grandkids and the same issues that most of us have. We all have. So this is my point. I know that you can be put in some very uncomfortable conversations, but you read people, if you just listen to them, you'll, you'll find out that they are in the same situation you're in. So if we can talk about it, things can be settled. Thank you. find a great, great starting those conversations in the neighborhood. Do you know a good restaurant outside the villages? works all the time. Do we have someone over here or no, please, please go ahead. Hello, my name is Dorothy and I am a member of the League of Women Voters. I'm very appreciative of this um, get together and seminar. And it's about how to start conversations. And what I have decided to do, and what I have been doing, is when somebody makes a comment, not to stay silent. And on the discrimination side, I have this little Starbucks group, it's a very diverse group. But anyway, somebody was talking about this guy, and I can't remember how the conversation started, but that they had done very good things, and, what they had done and other things and then you know he's jewish and then it comes back he did something i was like what does being jewish have to do with the price of tea in china <laughs> and that's what i i i said to him. i said why, why did you make that comment well he is jewish and i said yeah but does that have something to do with what you were talking about so i've had several things in my past which i wish i would have said something so I'm not going to be silent anymore when somebody makes some slur or some strange comment about you know, Blacks being violent, those types of things, or Puerto Ricans can't speak English, you know, those types of things, which I've heard. And uh, I don't know, it might be that I have blue eyes and blonde hair, and I used to be a physical therapist a long time ago, Patients would tell me things that I don't think that they would tell anybody else. Like they said, well, you know, I don't, really don't want that therapist over there tweeting. And I said, why? Oh, I, I don't know. I said, that's Lisa Lowe. She went to a better school than I did. And you got me. <laughs> so, those types of things. Anyway, thank you. Please. Hi, I'm Chris. And um, one thing that I have learned that has really changed the way I look at race is that I've learned that race was a social construct. It isn't a real thing. Our DNA is the same, everybody. And um, well, I don't know. Anyway, there aren't many differences. And, and this was constructed hundreds of years ago for money, you know, and it isn't really a thing, but it has become a thing, and it's important that we realize that. And another thing is, um, I'm part of a group that's trying to do some racial healing in Lake County, and one we use something called mindful inquiry when we're talking with other people, and if you I don't know if you can Google that and find it, but it, it has really good questions. Like, tell me more about that and, and to get that curiosity that you're talking about. So look up mindful inquiry and it gives you some good questions to talk when you're talking to someone. Thank you. I'm afraid this is going to be our last question. Um, we're running out of time, but please go ahead. Hi, everybody. My name is Terry. And really what we're talking about here today is racial trauma. 
It's the trauma that's been passed down through generations and generations of white and black people and brown people. And what this means is that the black population has been traumatized and tortured and killed and you name it, it's happened to them. That is passed down in their bodies over the generations. We as white people were the perpetrators. We also have a little bit of racial trauma in our system too because of what we perpetuate. And what we are proposing is in Lake County, we are a group, and the lady that was just speaking, it's a group, group called Pathways to Racial Healing. We're actually going to offer racial healing sessions to our community. It's all based on what we call a courageous conversation. It has a protocol to it, and it has mindful inquiry in it, like Chris just mentioned. We have equity tools that we've developed that can monitor these conversations so that if they ever do get out of hand, there's a way to get out of that. And uh, this will be coming to the Lake County area soon. I do have a couple contacts within the League of Women Voters. Please be aware that uh, we're going to be offering these and we'll be inviting the public to attend. Thank you. Thank you. We have two, two paid political announcements. I'll make the first one. Uh, for those of you who are in the villages Monday, civil discourse is meeting at Colony Cottage. And the topic, and this was not planned in advance, is why is my skin this color and does it matter? Now, if you're interested in getting on our mailing list, talk to me. Stephen, you wanted to say something also. Sure. Um, so we have an exhibit that Daryl Davis actually helped build. It's at the Holocaust Center in Maitland, Florida. We'd love for you to come out and take a look at it. But not only just this video, but Scott Shepard Grove is there. He's the gentleman that you saw, uh, as well as some of the uh, pieces that Daryl has loaned to us, showing the white supremacist groups that still, out of the 700 groups that still perpetuate and thrive throughout the United States today. Uh, Daryl Davis is also going to be at the Holocaust Center uh, for a presentation and for a discussion. Uh, back in the back is uh, Leah Hornick. She's uh, our education specialist. She has cards that have uh, a little bit of information if you'd like to ask questions back there by April 2nd. It's 2 o'clock, Leah? 2 p.m. on April 2nd? No, 2 p.m. on April 2nd. So uh, there's registration on our website. There's also the information will be on the card. So we'd love to see everyone. Please come down. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we're just, thank you all, first of all, for participating. Dan, you had a couple of things you wanted to yes, say. Yes, first of thank you very much, each of you, for caring enough to show up today. Hats off to you. We certainly hope you are inspired to further develop the skills needed to talk with people whose views are vastly different than your own. Then watch for opportunities to engage in healthy dialogue that can change a heart. Never doubt that you can make a difference. And of course, another way to make a difference is to vote every chance you get so your voice is heard and encourage your friends to do the same. Support your local League of Women Voters and other nonpartisan get out the vote efforts in your community. And be informed on the candidates by, if you're not familiar with it, vote 411. It was up there. <laughs> it was there briefly. Anyway, vote411.org is where you can get information about the elections and the candidates. And we will have some constitutional amendments on the ballot this fall. So uh, anyway, if you or you know of an organization you represent that wishes to work with others to combat prejudice, let us know by completing the Contact Us form on our website. We'd love to promote these uh, efforts in Lake County that are starting on these conversations about racial justice. And our speakers will be available to you as you exit. And Patton's book, Unmasked, the rise and fall of the 20th Ku Klux Klan is for sale, and Anne will be happy to provide you with an autographed copy. And Stephen has a page of useful resources to help you learn more about engaging in civil conversations. Thank you very much to our panelists and to Shar Griffin and the entire league team who put this together. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes, no. 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 Yes,